Thank you so much for joining us here on Wednesday evening. Charles Wolin, Joel Soria here for another edition of Black and Azul here in its 14th episode, a live episode, and plenty to talk about tonight as Chris Wondolowski breaks the all-time MLS goal scoring record. Four goals, not just one, two, three, but four goals in a match in a very, very interesting uh, Saturday afternoon initial snap reaction, Joel. Well, you know, I think this entire episode deserves to just talk about Chris Wondolowski. What he did on Saturday was beyond remarkable. It was, to me, one of the most fascinating moments in San Jose Earthquakes history. He is a player that will forever be remembered for what he's done on the field and that is becoming MLS all-time goal scorer in a very, very unordinary fashion. Yeah, I mean, the manner in which it happened was beautiful in itself for all of you football romantics out there. Wasn't slated to start, started the match, scored four goals in the rain, in the kind of muggy fog of the Bay Area, and just completely does this thing, takes care of this record, surpasses it, just in one match itself, and kind of puts this record to bed. It's behind him now, but it's such a terrific achievement for a guy that really deserves it. I mean, I couldn't think of anybody that deserves it more than Wondolowski. I mean, he's he's been with this team for such a long time. On this show, I always talk about the San, San Jose Wondolowskis, in, in a way, <laughs> this captain, this, this heartbeat, this hard worker. I just couldn't say any more that, you know, he deserves it. Yeah, absolutely. He deserves all of it. Everything, like I said on Twitter, you know, all the odds were against Chris Wondolowski from the start, you know, playing local soccer and then going to Chico State Division Two as a player who wasn't really, you know, categorized as a as a through and through soccer player, ran track, had an offer from Berkeley which, you know, nine, nine out of 10 people will not turn down, but he had this passion for soccer. He pursued it at a very low level. And at that time, you know, keep in mind early 2000s, soccer in America is in a very, very naive stage in, a, in an infant stage. And, you know, for him to go to Chico State, get drafted through the supplementary draft, you know, which at that time, you know, like I said, it's, it's just like drafting, uh, you know, any any amateur player. And the odds were, were surely against him. And what he does and how he did it with patience, with a lot of character, with passion, um, it's just truly remarkable, you know, a, a, a story that, you know, we shouldn't be telling. It should be those, you know, working for ESPN, those who are uh, putting together a 30 for 30. That's the type of story that Chris Wondolowski has left for all of us, um, you know, to to soak in. And I think uh, his former teammate Craig Wabel said it said it best. You know, he was he had played with uh, Chris Wondolowski for some time, and and let's read actually the quote that he had to say about uh, Wondolowski. People will put asterisks by it. It's because he's not the big, flashy, camera-hungry guy. He's not the self-promoting goal scorer. He's almost an antithesis. Ant antithesis. <laughs> yeah, a white goal scorer are. in terms of personality. Sorry, I kind of got cut up there, but you know, he says it. He says it so well. Um, it, it, he's he's pretty much the opposite of what a goal scorer is. We know goal scorers. You know, we we know the Luis Suarez's of the world. We know even the Joseph Martinez's of the world. You know, they're with all due respect, you know, they're, they're, uh, Martinez himself, he's much more of a flashy guy. He, he likes the limelight. He likes the spotlight. And, and Chris Wondolowski does everything, you know, so subtly, so behind the scenes. And, you know, on the field when he scores, I mean, we see it on the field when he scores. He scored four on Saturday in emphatic fashion. And the first thing that he did was go, uh, to go celebrate it with his fans, you know or with the fans and with his teammates. And that says a lot about Chris, you know, he could have, you know, ran down the touchline. He could have ran to the corner. He could have stared at the camera. He could have done a million things, but he decided to go to his teammates, to Shea Salinas, 
you know, because that's that's what he is. He's a, he's a, a team player. He's, you know, your average Joe turned into a legend. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating story. It's, it's an amazing story. For those of you that follow the show know that I used to work for the Earthquakes. When they came back, 2008, I was a PR intern. 2009, I was a PR intern and then eventually joined the staff full-time in 2010 and 2011 doing sponsorship and, and ticket sales. And I'll still never forget his equalizer against Kansas City back in 2009. And I was sitting in the press box and my assignment was to get quotes after the match. And we were hanging out in the press box and we would, you know, talk to other journalists and, and, and such, but working as an official media capacity for the team, when he scored the goal, I was actually doing a, a demo broadcast into a little reel because I, I'm also in broadcasting for play-by-play -play stuff. And I was doing that into a reel and my, my broadcast partner at the time, who was also doing the demo reel with me, screamed so loud into, into the tape recorder. And I'll, I'll never forget that echo. Um, and that, uh, that was really special to me because that's really my Wondolowski story. He's touched everyone in a certain way. All fans, everyone that's part of the franchise, everyone that's part of the front office. It's the way he handles himself, the what, what he does off the field, his community work. Um, I get the chance to interact with him at Street Soccer USA, a nonprofit organization that uh, gives opportunities to underserved youth and and uh, adults that are having a difficult time in their lives and being able to pick them up and he spends the day up uh, in San Francisco in Union Square and, and hangs out and, and plays soccer and he's there he's visible um, it, a couple of years ago I got a chance to have him as an analyst for the championship game um, for uh, a bunch of the cities that played against one another I think it was Minneapolis versus Chicago or something like that um, and so for me, you know, it, it is a deeply personal thing, and, and I think a lot of other folks have that same um, uh, same kind of story to tell about Wando, or or or, or how Wando specifically, um, you know, has entered their life. Um, when when I interviewed Matt White in New York in our first or second episode, he created a Chris Wondolowski eight in the exact font of Major League I Soccer and he and he put that up and and he can't stop talking about it and so uh, again it, it's not just a moment where he got it by one by one and then made it you know did it in, in another game it's a very special evening the manner in which it happened four goals this explosion the weather seeing this image of Chris Wondolowski screaming to the heavens and celebrating with the rest of his teammates it, it's it's something to behold and and it's, um, again, a, a good thing to see for our soccer in this country. Yeah, absolutely. And what, you know, what a touching story. I, I've had the privilege of covering the San Jose Earthquakes for the past three seasons. So about roughly two and a half years around Wondolowski, maybe twice a week, three times a week, uh, but most, mostly once a week, right? So I've, I've been able to interview him, you know, dozens of times. I've, I've been able to see how he carries himself, you know, behind the scenes as well. And you know, he's that. He's he's such a giver to the community. He's such a, a, a giver to the fans. Um, you know, I, I I have so many memories of leaving Avaya Stadium late at night, you know, hours, maybe maybe an hour or so after after we've wrapped up all the press work and you know, it happens to be that Chris is still out in the parking lot signing autographs, right? You know, to those to those few kids that are hanging around wanting to, to meet their idol. And I think that that says a lot about him because, you know, most of the players, they like to leave soon as, as, as the game wraps up. You know, that's that's the thing. You, you come into the office, you do your work and you and you go home. But but Chris, you know, has that that itch, you know, to, to want to give back, to want to inspire those those kids who who might look up to him, which which are many, which are, are, are many, many. And, you know, like I said, it's just extraordinary. And I, I think like a lot of people have said it, it couldn't have happened to, to a better person. He was very deserving of it. And like you said, it's, it's, it, it's, it's almost like a movie, right? He's, he's almost filmed all of it. He's, he's almost, this was the penultimate conclusion. Chris Wondolowski's has, story has two conclusions in my opinion. One was breaking the record and the final one is going to be a send off, which I think uh, is going to probably be the most emotional day in Quake's history. 
when that does happen. When will that happen? We don't know. But he has written a one of a kind script. Um, you know, something that we will probably never ever see in this league. Uh, I won't say again, but for a very long time. Yeah, and, and thank you guys for, for tuning in again to episode number 14 of Black Ana Azul. It's an interactive show. Feel free to uh, go to the side and ask us some questions. We like to take questions. Tim Harrison, I, I do apologize about the theme music in, in the beginning. We're a little theme music uh, obsessed over here. We, we, we got to do a little dance before we go on air. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you, you, you raise a great question, um, and we have it here that we are going to ask, um, and I'm going to ask Joel now. But uh, you write, God forbid, is there anyone at the league at the moment who might be able to challenge for the scoring record in coming years? And some of the names we're throwing out in the pre, pre-show pre were Kai Kamara and Joseph Martinez. Chris Wanolowski actually weighed in on this. Um, but, but what do you make of that? Yeah, so for those who listen to Extra Time Radio, Chris Wanolowski was on the show this week. And he did assess that question. Who is going to surpass his new record sitting at 148 at the moment? I think Joseph Martinez would be a good option, but given the fact that MLS is slowly starting to turn into a selling league, I don't think that's going to be possible. Joseph Martinez is young. Yes, he's 25 years of age. He, you know, blew through the previous single season goal scoring record that was set by Chris Wondolowski himself. And, but, you know, he's a player that in a couple of years, if he continues, you know, to do well, will be in Europe or he can, you know, make a jump to Liga and Mekis. You know, he's, he's, he's a hot commodity within the market. Whether he continues his trend or not, he's going to have those 30 plus goals in 2018 to his name that will definitely have a couple of suitors lined up. And then you have Kai Kamara, which I think um, Chris also weighed in on. And I think Kai, out of everyone within the league, has the best chance to surpass Wando. And here's the reason why. He's sitting about roughly 30 goals behind him, 30 to 40 goals. He's he's uh, he's still, you know, a, a really proven goal scorer in the league. He still continues to score goals uh, for the Rapids. But the one thing with Kai is that he's 34 years of age, right? So he's he's up there in age as well. And how long is he going to play for? I don't, I don't know if he has enough in his legs to keep going and to keep scoring at, at such a high rate. I would also probably throw in BWP in the, in the mix, you know, Brad, Bradley Wright Phillips, who's, uh, who was the fastest to hit 100 goals in the league. But then again, we're, you know, we're, we're there, we're back to, to square one again. He's 30-something he's as well. You know, he's well into his 30s. So these players don't really have that much gas left. And Chris Wondolowski, you know, did it in such a short span you know you can't take that away from him if he had been playing in the league around and and would have been productive around the time that joseph martinez started being productive you know the goal tally would definitely be up in in the 200s without a doubt yeah i I completely agree with you on the the joseph martinez uh uh you know potentially being there but i do think he'll get sold to a a big club in in europe uh, you saw that with his teammate, uh, you know, Miguel Almiron uh, in, in, in the transfer window. In terms of Kai, you know, I think with Kai, there's so many different teams that he's played for. And you take a look at the numbers, 14 last year, 12 the year before, 7 the year before, 5, 22, 7, 11, 9, 10. He, he's got to produce 10 or 15 goal seasons. And, you know, it's just very up and down. Um, Kai was at the Earthquakes when I worked there back in 2008 as well. He's a great professional, um, and I'd love to see him get close. Uh, But I I don't know. With age, you're right. And and with BWP, here's the interesting part about it is I could see BWP actually going back to England at some point, playing for a championship club or League One side. Charlton Athletic, uh, you know, they they may get promoted to the championship, (laughs) and he came from there. Uh, So... You never know with BWP what he's going to do, but I think he'll go back to England at some point to finish his career as well. So it's a very similar and I, with the Martinez story for me. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a record that is going to hold up for a very long time because also, you know, within those lines of the of the league becoming a seller's league, you have players who might shine early on but are going to get exported abroad, right? 
if maybe there will be another American who will tally up, you know, goals week in and week out, but they won't last in the league. You know, whether it be domestic or international, you know, players like Joseph Martinez don't really have a long time, won't have a long time within this league because, you know, as the league also continues to grow, more eyes are on it, more scouts, you know, turn up to games and the likelihood of them, you know, departing also increase. So I think Wando did it at the at the right time, you know, when when the league was still a bit irrelevant and, you know, he did the he did the dirty work. He also did it, like I said, in emphatic fashion, almost 10 straight, nine straight seasons with more than 10 goals is, is remarkable. And, um, you know, he, he made a statement for himself. And I think that statement is going to last for, for quite some time. I feel comfortable saying that. You guys are tuning into episode number 14 of Black and Azul. Again, it's a live show. Keep your questions coming. Vintage on tap. You raise a great question. We won't bring it up just yet. <laughs> we're going to have a special little segment on the show that we're going to answer that question. By the way, I'm not sure what Vintage on Tap is, so feel free to leave your product uh, and a little bit of blurb about what Vintage on Tap is because I am curious to know. He is Joel Soria. I am Charles Wolin. Let's take a look and hear from Chris Wondolowski about potentially winning a trophy and what that would mean to him. Oh, first and foremost, and uh, this is the only goal now, is uh, I want to lift a trophy uh, one way or another, U.S. Open Cup, uh, Supporter Shield, uh, especially MLS Cup. Um, that is right now the main goal and uh, has been and will be. Uh, you know, again, I will trade all 148 to uh, lift, a, lift a trophy up as captain and uh, especially for this club right now and where this team has got, has been and uh, where it's going. I think it's headed in a bright bright future and a great direction and uh, hoping to do that. Well, there he is, the man himself, Chris Wanolowski, talking about wanting to lift a trophy as a captain. He doesn't care if it's a supporter shield or an open cup or an MLS cup. He just wants to lift something. Joel, can the Quakes win a title of any kind with Chris Wanolowski as their captain? I will come back to the question shortly. I want to give a little bit of context about the question. So okay. the person asking the question says, what is next for you? You know, in, in, in your illustrious career, what is next? What, what does Wando want to accomplish? And, you know, he disregards his 148 goals and puts mm. the team first. That embodies Chris 100%. That's who he is. And just when you thought you couldn't love him more, he goes on and does that. <laughs> yeah. You know, four days removed from becoming MLS's all-time leading goal scorer, he makes that statement. It's profound. It's, it, it's, it's you, you know, like I said, it just, it really, really just takes this story to another level. You know, it opens another valve and, and, and gives everyone just that, that romantic feeling of, you know, what this truly is. It's, it's, it's remarkable. But now to answer your question, um, you know, I think, I think the Quakes don't really have a good chance to win the MLS Cup this season. They, they surely don't have a good chance to take the supporter shield. I, I think that is for LAFC to lose. And I've said it, you know, from day one, LAFC is the best team in the league without a doubt. Now, I think they do well as, as everyone who's going to be coming into the, the tournament in the fourth round, so in a couple of weeks here, I think the Quakes do have a good chance to make a deep run in the U.S. Open Cup. And here's why. They're pretty deep. I, I don't think uh, a lot of people have touched base on that, but the Quakes are actually pretty deep, this team. They have a lot of youngsters in the mix who are surely going to benefit the Quakes when they're going to have to deal with the international rule that uh, implies in the U.S. Open Cup, right? Only having X amount of international players on the field. You have... You know, young domestic talent, in addition to Jackson Ewell and Nick Lima and JT Marcinkowski, you have Gilbert Fuentes and you have others in there who can definitely, you know, take this team probably to, to the next level when, you know, legs are tired, international duty is, is upon the team as well. So I, I, think, I think they have a good chance in the U.S. Open Cup. And we saw it last year with the Houston Dynamo. I don't think... 
many expected Dynamo to to lift the cup, and they did. They did it. You know, they did it, and they earned a spot into the Champions League, which which is also uh, another benefit of winning the U.S. Open Cup. Yeah, I agree with you with the Supporter Shield and MLS Cup. I think it's a little bit of a stretch, although I'm an ultimate optimist. And <laughs> at the end of the day, I used to work for the team. And, and uh, you know, this year is a clearly a rebuilding year, but on the, the positive, uh, on, on a very good positive track, and they're on the front foot, um, as you guys know. The Open Cup presents an interesting opportunity for this San Jose Earthquakes team. In the past, I think it was overlooked and it, it was a chance for some of the reserve players or players that weren't in the starting 11 to play and there were some long games uh there were quite a few quite a few matches that went into extra times some into penalties in the club's history but i think this club's history is still meant to be written when it comes to the open cup and with matthias almeida at the helm and you and i were chatting in the in the pre-show here this could be ripe for an Open Cup uh, run, well, and so why not? I, I, you know, and why not take it seriously? Plus, you got youngsters that want to impress the manager that are not in the side that are that are not even really named to the bench, and so Calvillo, these, yeah, these players are going to want to get Kowski. in and continue to contribute and show the manager that they shouldn't go. So that that's that's where I see well, that. Well, and, and we don't we don't really even have to look uh, that far back into the team's history. Twenty seventeen, uh, a team that surely wasn't a playoff team. And, uh, you know, showed that when they visited the Vancouver Whitecaps in that 5-0 drilling were literally, you know, a couple penalties away from, from getting to the final. You know, they lost in the semis to, to Sporting KC in penalties. And, you know, like I said, they weren't, they weren't that formal, formidable team in the regular season, but they were able to squeeze victories, you know, on the road during the MLS Cup. And... And I think we, we have Jamin here on the studio who's going to join us shortly, and he, he brought up a great point as well. You know, Matias Almeida has experience in, in cup situations. In fact, two of the titles that he won at Chivas were, were cups in, in, you know, in domestic tournaments, in those games that, you know, it just doesn't matter how you win. As long as you win, you live another day. And I think that's really, that's really the, the secret here this, this time around is, that secret ingredient is that they have Almeida on their side, and and he just knows how to squeeze, uh, you know, every ounce out of them in cup situations. So, you know, if you if you ask me that question, you know, I guess to condense my answer, that that's what it is. You know, I think their best chance at lifting a cup with Wondolowski is this year's edition of the U.S. Open Cup. So we put all that into a sieve, and we both have a U.S. Open Cup run for you. So stay tuned. We'll have to see how that uh, pans out. One of the other headlines this week is talking about Danny Hoosin as well being out of the side, having a little bit of a, a late fitness. Uh, he failed a late fitness test. That's why Chris was in, the, was in the starting 11. And a lot of fans like to weigh up this debate of Chris Wondolowski, Danny Hoosin, Chris Wondolowski, Danny Hoosin. Well, we have a very special little segment we call it a little debate. And we're gonna get going as we're gonna introduce Jamin Moore to the show, also from Quake's Epicenter. We'll be right there. All right, we're ready for our little debate here. Joel Soria, Jamin Moore, Joel Soria in the Chris Wondolowski camp. <laughs> Why Chris Wondolowski should continue to start. Jamin Moore in the Danny Hoosin camp and why Danny Hoosin should start. So I give it to you first. Give us your pitch. Well, Ellie, let, let's start with the results. I mean, we started the season with Wando uh, in the starting lineup. Danny Hoosen was getting green card taken care of. And we saw results immediately. We saw four straight losses with Wando on the pitch and changes needed to be made. And one of the changes that had a big impact immediately, and we were talking about it in the press box in that first game that Danny Hoosen started, was Danny Hoosen. Danny Hoosen was on the pitch. Yes, uh, so was Florian Youngworth. Yes, so was Jackson Ewell. But he was the one who had the immediate impact and he got the goals right away. 
goals which we were not getting at the forward position to that point. And I think just those results show us immediately the type of impact that Danny Hooson can have uh, for this team, uh, just in the results themselves as a starting point. So that's a good opening statement. Joel, opening statement. Well, I'll, 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 make, this, uh, I'll make this very short. In 90 minutes, Chris Wondolowski was able to surpass not only Landon Donovan, but Danny Hoosen himself and became the co-leading goal scorer of the team. In 90 minutes, four goals, one touch each. You know, that's, that's the magic that Wando can deliver if he gets the proper service. And I think uh, those first four games, obviously the, the team was just starting to feel out what it was like to play under Almeida's gruesome style. And, you know, now that you introduce him at a time where the, the, the system is much more fluid, where you have Jackson Ewell playing the way that he's playing, where you have Cristian Espinosa finally feeling comfortable to the league's rigors, you get that type of performance from Chris Wondolowski. And no, nothing, nothing makes me think that he can't do it again. Absolutely. He absolutely can do it again. He can continue this type of run, but it's unlikely. And let me just try to tell you why. If you take a look at the history of Chris Wondolowski with this team, his most successful years were when he was playing with a second striker. Now, I'm not going to say I'm in the camp of Chris Wondolowski cannot be a, a lone striker, because I think he's shown us that he can. He showed it this past weekend. However, if you actually take a look at the way that he's played, you can see that he is uh, more effective at getting touches when he is working with a second striker, and he doesn't get those touches when he is a lone striker. And his history has shown that for him to score goals, he needs to have more touches than fewer touches. And that's what we're seeing is if you take a look at the, the data, the information that we have about Chris Wondolowski's career, you can see that it's important for him to get more touches in games that he has goals, in games that he has multiple goals. He is getting more touches in those games than in the games that he is not getting a goal. And that's a big difference. The other difference I see between Chris Wondolowski and Danny Hooson is where the touches are coming. Danny Hooson gets his touches on average eight yards further up the pitch than Chris Wondolowski does. What that tells me is that he stretches the field. Right. He's a true number nine. He gives the team an opportunity to really kind of spread and really be able to play through the middle. When Wondolowski plays, he sits deeper. In fact, he sits almost in the same position that he did when the team had two strikers. And so even as a lone striker, he's still sitting deeper. That's compressing the midfield. That's forcing the central midfielders to have to play through difficult situations where there's probably more pressure because the field is not as spread. And fr quite frankly, the team is not built around its central midfield and being able to play the ball through the middle. Right now, it's most successful when the wingers are playing well. And so to me, that's important to stretch the field and be able to give that space. One of my comments to you, Joel, uh, I wasn't at the game, but you and I were, were communicating back and forth during the game, was that uh, we, were, we were seeing Wando starting to drop deeper. And earlier in the game, it was a bit of a problem. And I was saying we needed to find ways to stretch the pitch with Espinoza and with Salinas on the wings in order to, get, to, well, that's, to make that happen. That's the plus, is that you know, years prior, you didn't have, you didn't have that Espinosa. Espinosa is, is a gem. He's a gem for the San Jose Earthquakes, a player that probably will not play for the Quakes after this season. He's a, he's a, he's a through and through impact player. And then you have Shea Salinas playing, you know, out of his mind per se, you know, he's, he's having such a good season this year. And, you know, you say that the Quakes can't play when Wando is pinned back or that, you know, that kind of hampers him from being able to be effect, as effective as Danny Husen. But like I said, you do have those flanks and you have players who are able to go up and down, run them in, 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 you know, in, really effective, in a really effective manner. And that, as it showed against the fire, no, don't get me wrong though, uh, the fire pr had a really disastrous game. It did. Specifically in, 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 the, in their back line. Right. You know, uh, Calvo, Francisco Calvo, newly arrived to the Chicago Fire, was largely at fault for Chris Wanda's first goal, mm -hmm. you know, for, for his record tying goal. He completely lost his mark. And, you know, I, I think we all know this, though. Chris is a fox in the box. He's not a guy who's going to stretch the field. He's not your traditional number nine. He's not your traditional soccer player. 
And that's why I believe, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit more anecdotal based. You are statistics. You're, you're trying to squash me with, <laughs> you're trying to squash me with statistics here, but you know, really, and, and in addition to all of that, Wondolowski is riding a high. I mean, how, 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 as Matias Almeida, how are you going to say no to continue, uh, to continue to, to not play him? Or how, how do you take him out of the starting 11 after such a performance? I think it's, it's difficult. I, I think definitely the fan sentiment, and I, I you know, I, maybe people will think I'm a Wando hater because I, I think that Husen is, is the better choice in the long term for the team. But I think right now you do have momentum with Chris. And I think you do probably, particularly Danny coming back from an injury, we don't know how he's going to be for this coming weekend against Toronto. So I think you do have to definitely give Chris an opportunity to see where he goes next. But I do think that ultimately you have to decide on a couple things. Do you want Wando and more records for Wando? And that's great if you do. But I think this team is right now in an eighth playoff position. They have a chance. They're very close, and they've taken points in six of the last eight games, and now is the time for this team to really actually strike. They have to make up points that they lost in those home losses in the beginning of the season. And so it's very important for them to be able to go on the road and get results right now. And Toronto is a team that's reeling a bit. They've, they've lost their last four. They have um, Pozuelo out. Uh, it, it looks like they may have an injury in the back line with Lawrence Simon. So this might be an opportunity for the Quakes to sneak in and be able to get some points on the road. And we have to, f to, to figure out how is the best way to do that on the road with this team right now. Here's, here's the question that I want to pose for you. Uh, who would you rather take in a dire moment when the Quakes need to just squeeze points, whether it's drawing a game or winning a game in the late stages? Would you choose Wando or would you choose Husen? I would choose Wando in a heartbeat. Uh, Jeff Carlisle's piece on Chris Wondolowski, which I highly recommend to everyone, had that statistic there. You know, Wando surpasses or has a higher percentage of scoring in those late minutes than anyone or than the league average itself. You know, this is a player that makes statements, you know, not not only time and time again, but in the most difficult situations. How many, you know, um, mind-boggling performances has he not delivered? I think I think uh, you know the highlights will will speak to that, and I, you know the the Quakes are turning a corner here. They are starting to accumulate points, and they need to score on the road. They need to win on the road, as you said earlier to me today. Danny doesn't do that. Completely agree. Look, in in the dying moments of a game, Chris Wondolowski is the person that you want. He's proven it time and time again. I've been there. Adivaya for many of those finishes, you know, throughout the years. But that's the difference between Chris Wondolowski, the super sub, and Chris Wondolowski, the starter. And I think really what you want to look at is you want Danny Hoosen to start those games. You want Danny Hoosen to stretch the field, wear out the opposition, uh, force them to have to play the ball in situations that are uncomfortable for them, because Wando doesn't make those players uncomfortable uh, when they pass the ball around the back line and they're looking for the pass to the middle. So that's 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 where Danny Hoosen is going to be a benefit. And I think that it's Danny Hoosen the starter and Chris Wondolowski the super sub. And I think Matias Almeida has shown us that he's willing to put them both on the pitch in the right situations. So it maybe we don't have to choose. Maybe the answer is both. Um, maybe you want you maybe, want maybe maybe <laughs> it is both. Maybe it is both and I'll, I'll this this will be my last word on the subject. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke with Cristian Espinosa, who has been pivotal, you know, a pivotal player for this team. And one thing that I got from him was that he was a bit lamentable that he wasn't able to provide the service that he was providing at that time to Danny Husen, to Chris Wondolowski. So now it turns out that that same service that he wished he would have provided for Wando in the first four games was delivered to him against the fire. So Danny Husen was able to take advantage of that service, and Wanda was able to do it as well. So maybe that's it. Maybe there isn't one or the other. Maybe it's not A or B. Maybe it's not black or white. You know. And, and the question is, in that situation, who do you take off, right? And and one of the reasons also that service has improved. Let's, let's not forget is Shea Salinas, who has who was inserted into that left winger position and reclaiming his role that he had 
in the years past, right? And 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 rekindling that connection with Wando. And now that that they've been able to provide that type of speed on both wings, now the Quakes have more threats, and the defenses have to deal with additional threats. That can free up Wando, but it also, I think, is an opportunity for Danny Hooson to find more space than he has been getting in the last couple games. And I've I've been kind of wondering in, in the last couple games if the injury that Hooson has uh, has uh, sustained as of right now that we know about was one that he may have have been having and so maybe in the past games before that also we we were starting to see a little bit of that effect it's possible but at this point we don't know and and we hope that Danny Hooson uh, feels better and makes it back to the team one way or the other for this coming weekend there you have it that's our first little debate it went to be kind of like a, a medium kind <laughs> of debate there but you've got stats You've got analytics, but we found some common ground, and we love it when we find common ground, which is cool and important. And we may have unlocked, you know, something interesting that we didn't know tonight, which A little is talking update. about service. And to be fair, I agree with that as well. And, you know, there is a question here about Espinoza. You were, you were chatting about it. Is, is there a chance that the Quakes could, could, could keep Espinoza at all? Well, that's going to be difficult. Um, from what I understand, he doesn't have an option to buy um, mm. in in his contract. Right. So I don't know what they would have to work out there with uh, Villarreal, who is the one who is uh, the owner of, of Cristian Espinosa, the one who paid $8.2 million back in 2016, I believe. They're going to want to get some of that back. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is all speculation, by the way. But you know, he's a player that probably warrants, a, 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 you know, million dollars at least. I would say, because he's still at such a, you know, it's 24 years of age. He yeah. still has a future ahead of him, and he's regained a, you know, that form here in San Jose. So he's not going to be cheap. It, it's going to be a tough task anytime you're, you know, uh, trying to strike a deal with with a big European team it's it's no easy task it's a lot of back and forth it's a lot of uh, no's it's it's a lot of uh, loops that you have to get around so you know we'll, we'll see how that goes but I, I wouldn't say the the chances are high the, the one ray of sunshine I, I think and, and I follow Villarreal uh, fairly well is they are a selling club and so they they do they 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 potentially could bite if you know the Quakes are interested if, right. if if he continues with a yeah. great season. Um, I think it as well. It should also be said that Espinosa never debuted for Los Submarinos, so it's it's possible. Right. Two more questions, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. Uh, Josue Hernandez, since summer is around the corner, how many transfers you expect the Quakes making this upcoming? summer transfer let's just change this into transfer talk because we've been doing this week in and week out now i'm gonna pitch it either one of you can take it well i think they will definitely be looking at a couple maybe two or three depending on what matias likes and we've we've been uh kind of hinting at this for for some time now i i, I still do know that the alanis the pursuit of alanis is still on uh, Chivas are are going to you know fight for him you know through through whatever whatever that will entail. That's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for them to secure that. And sure, they're going to want to bring in a couple of DPs as well. I, they they're in in dire need of a of a new DP of a of a player who's going to be able to change you know those outcomes. And but aside from that, you know we're going to have to wait. A lot of players are also going to be leaving for. Uh, international duty, so they're going to be thin. Yeah, I think center back is definitely a position of need still. Um, I think that with Open Cup coming, there's going to be a compressed schedule, and I think they're going to need some of that rotation. And I would look at what they have behind their starters right now, and they're, they're, it is still a position of need. I'd also have to say, and I think you've said it in previous episodes as well, they, they probably are looking at Magnus Eriksson's position, that number 10, yeah. and they, they are looking at that as a position that can definitely be upgraded. Magnus has been very serviceable. He's done more, I think, than people thought he would be able to do in the 10, and I want to give him credit for the job that he's done. But I also think that there's more that Matias would want out of that particular position in his style. Exactly. And Magnus Absolutely. is not going to provide that. And so I think it is something that they're going to be looking at trying to fill a need there at the at the number 10 spot. And we see that, that filling that need in the number 10 spot has changed teams in MLS 
to have much better second half of well, the that's, season. Well, that's the go-to position, team. right? When you want to yeah. bring in a DP, you go for that 10, that that playmaker, that genius. Toronto FC did it, you know, just a couple of months ago with Pozuelo. He yep. comes in and he literally lights uh, the league up, LAFC, you know, try to follow that, I guess, with Carlos Vela, but Carlos Vela is more of an inverted right winger. But Nico Ladero two years ago. Nico Ladero. Sanders, I mean, took them to a tire. I mean, they well. try to do that yeah. with Vaco. Jess, I, I right. recall that introductory press conference. I asked Jesse Furinelli if Vaco was, you know, in, in other words, their Ladero. Right. They're on Miron, and he said, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we want. That's the profile that we were looking for. And let's just say from that moment to now, Vaco has not really played that part. In fact, we found out he's actually behind Magnus Eriksson. So there's been a lot of talk of what is Vaco's position. Is he a left wing? Is he a right wing? Is he is he a 10? <laughs> Matias actually answered the question. He said the, after the game that Vaco scored the goal that he's actually supposed to be playing Magnus's position, that there's competition for that right. position. And he's Magnus a 10 secondary striker. He's so, right behind the, the goal scorer. Right. So, you know, I, I think at the moment we can kind of see, you know, where things are at with Vaco based upon the playing time. Right. We're getting wizardly and almost we're going to unleash our inner genie, if you will, when it comes to talking about the number 10 position. I agree, lads, the number 10 position is a, is a problem position for the San Jose Earthquakes. I think Magnus is, is again, playing out of his skin and, and doing more than he's been asked to do. Right. But I still give him a, a, a kind of a B minus, C plus. Uh, traditionally, the Quakes have not had a good, solid number 10 that's been reliable since they've come back to San Jose. Right. Um, let's just be clear about that. And I think that's... Also, we can chat about this for a long time, and we can pontificate and, and throw out those names. Um, but it's also an exciting time. It's mysterious that this team doesn't have a number 10, and it's it's kind of weird. But you kind of got to love it, and maybe they'll solve this number 10 riddle one of these days. Uh, final question comes here from Ren1018. Who will replace Lima, Godoy, and Cummings when Gold Cup action Starts. I'm going to say obviously the youngsters. Some some other players will come into the side. Marcos Lopez exactly. replacing Lima. Duke Lacroix potentially from from Reno. It, it As looks that, like look like he's not cup tied, so yeah. he didn't play in in Reno's Reno's uh, Open Cup, and so that Probably means done that he purposely. might be available yeah. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then for Godoy, maybe you can slot in Calvillo. You can Jutson. Yeah, uh, Luis Fernandez. Luis who Fernandez hasn't seen a lot of playing time. It's a really good opportunity for him. For Cavillo I think I think Jutson would probably be above Jutson. for for Cummings. You can slot in Kasia. Kasia, who's Kasia, who's been yeah, waiting. Alter, who's serviceable in that type of game. You know, they, they've they've got a little bit of of depth for an Open Cup type situation right there. Not not one I think that makes them a, a playoff run. Uh, type situation, but one I think that would work for an Open Cup type situation. Exactly. Final comment is going to come from Emmanuel TWR. It's a two-part comment, so just bear with us, but I have to read it because it was before our show even started and really resonated with me here, and I want to send us off in, in this manner. Uh, goes to show the resilience of Wando and how effective he has been no matter the changes this team has been going through the past number of years. Proud of this achievement. Well, I was hearing it on the radio, 1370 Caliente, with Carlos Cesar Rivera. The great. The great, and hopefully we'll have him on our show one of these days. They brought up a great point. Wano did this with a team that has not been in the playoffs versus Donovan and Galaxy that had been more competitive. So just think. Think about that for a second. Talked about unconventional striker. We talked about a well-rounded striker, someone that's very involved in their community, someone that truly cares about their community, someone that's been with the team for 10 plus seasons. That's loyalty, that's heart, that's passion at the end of the day. Jamin Moore, Joel Soria, I'm Charles Wolin for our producer Jason Scholl, our associate producer Aaron Scholl. This is Black and Azul. We will see you next week. Thanks so much for tuning in.